Pivot est la première coopérative d'architecture au Québec, fondée en 2017. Elle a été confondée afin d'organiser une pratique d'architecture autour d'une structure autogérée et transparente. Au sein de cette équipe constituée de 15 personnes, architecture, designers, techniciens et destinataires, les ressources et responsabilités sont partagées et les décisions importantes prises en, grâce à un processus démocratique. Cette approche permet de travailler de façon participative autant au sein de l'équipe qu'avec des clients, clientes et collaborateurs et collaboratrices, mettant leur savoir-faire professionnel au service de particuliers, de groupes communautaires et institutionnels. Pivot veut mettre la créativité au, serv au service d'une architecture qui génère de la valeur pour tous. Donc aujourd'hui, de Pivot, nous avons Colline Lachoc, et, euh, qui est membre fondatrice où elle travaille comme euh, de Pivot, où elle travaille comme architecte avec un intérêt particulier à aider les gens à imaginer et à repenser leurs espaces, utilisant notamment ses capacités de facilitatrice ainsi que sa formation en anthropologie. Suzanne Lord-Doucet vise euh, à contribuer à l'avancement d'une architecture à dimension inclusive et sociale via de nombreuses collaborations avec le milieu communautaire qui lui ont permis de développer une approche de design participatif dans un contexte de sensibilisation, d'idéation et de recherche-action. Et euh, pour accompagner Pivot, on a l'équipe de Execo, née à Montréal en 2006. Execo utilise la créativité intellectuelle et artistique au service d'une transformation sociale inclusive et émancipatrice. Leur approche reconnaît avant tout le potentiel de chacun et chacune à réfléchir, analyser, agir, créer et à être partie prenante de la société, quelle que soit sa situation ou son parcours. Execo présume l'égalité des intelligences. Donc, d'Execo, on a William Giacomo Beauchemin, chercheur euh, et médiateur au sein d'Execo depuis 2014. Il s'occupe des projets de recherche et action participative au sein des laboratoires d'innovation sociale de l'organisation. Et Marie-Paul Grimaldi est poète et fait de la médiation pour Execo depuis 2013 sur différents projets touchant autant à la culture générale, la littérature et la philosophie. Bonjour, est-ce que vous m'entendez? Vous êtes vraiment nombreux. Salut. <rire> um, Aujourd'hui, euh, euh, nous de Pivot, moi et Suzanne, nous allons vous présenter euh, avec nos amis de Execo un projet qui s'appelle um, Espace de rêve, Dream Home. And I'll go on from here in English. I just realized it's automatic. The introduction was in French. I went on in French. Um, but the rest of the presentation will be in English. Um, uh, the project uh, is a project that came out of um, an observation. There was a debate at a, um, there was a, you know, once in a while homelessness comes up in the news. And there was a debate between some uh, people running shelters, some academics about, you know, the best answers to uh, this issue, the way that it could be dealt with. And it struck us that that uh, one voice was missing um, uh, in the debate, and that was the debate, of, that was the voice of the people who actually live in situations of homelessness. So at about the same time, we uh, met um, Execo and learned about their work. Uh, Execo uh, works with people um, in all kinds of marginalized situations to um, uh, bring out the collective intelligence of all of us um, uh, to deal with the, uh, the equality of uh, contributions that all kinds of people can have. Um, and it struck us that this would be a good opportunity, particularly uh, to architects who'd been working in social housing and had done participatory design in that world where the amount you can decide, the, the, the variation is about this big. Um, we decided to ask the big question, which is, if you could live anywhere, where would it be? Um, and we asked this question um, to people living in situations of homelessness uh, or near the street. Um, we, we looked at um, a series of workshops, to, so some, some creative workshops, um, looking at uh, how to, uh, you know, a, a, a maquette or a drawing of your ideal place to live. Um, really taking all of the boundaries away and um, exploring this question um, in a more profound way. Um, so uh, the, the end goal of this process was to, um, to have an exhibition, so to, to bring these voices to the public, to really um, expose these ideas and these visions to a wider public. Um, I'm just flipping through a few images. Um, the, the kinds of work that people did was stunning. Um, if you asked any architect in two hours to make a mech head of their dream home, you can imagine it's a super challenging question. Um, the one on the left is a, a floating house um, with a hole in the floor so you can fish. Um, and then you could move it also during the, during the year or during the week to get a different view. Um, the middle house is a, is a house where you can um, bring all the animals, 
all the stray animals that are around and um, create a living environment with them and the house. Um, on the other end is a, an artist's workshop and retreat uh, in a tree. Um, there were there were amazing projects that came out of uh, out of these workshops, um, and when we went to Execo with our ideas. Uh, they had comments, <laughs> and they helped us to refine the work that we were going to do. Uh, we wanted to talk to you a little more in detail about what that means. Uh, when we do participatory design, we like to start with um, a question that puts people in an expertise position. So we thought, well, what if we asked people um, if they could live, uh, if they could tell us about the best place and the worst place they ever lived? You know, because it's, it's kind of like you're the expert on that. You're the only one who really knows, and it's, it starts the conversation from that position. Um, and it was quickly pointed out to us that maybe that's a kind of traumatic question for people who have been uh, in situations of homelessness. So, you know, we revised, we reworked, we added a whole other workshop because um, it was pointed out to us that a lot of people don't know what architects do and really wanted to know. So we added a workshop that was just about what architecture is. Um, and it was, uh, uh, so it was, you know, a great learning process for us. We reworked a lot of things. Um, so we ended up doing a series of workshops uh, uh, that changed as we went along. We, we had an idea about doing a workshop about uh, with about people's individual views and then bringing the same people together to kind of look at a neighborhood. Um, but as a lot of people here know, having two or three or four workshops with the same people who are in situations of homelessness is pretty hard. It's, it's, it's a hard uh, thing to actually logistically manage. Um, so we did have some people that came multiple times, but not as much as we thought they might. We also had an idea about um, taking the, uh, the uh, art out into the streets and into the metro, I'm going to go back a little, um, to get comments from other people about the work, to, to have them be inspired by someone else's art, uh, to offer uh, suggestions or ways to improve uh, those pieces. Um, and what we discovered is people didn't, weren't comfortable commenting on someone else's artwork, and that was, that was interesting too. Um, people did come up with their own pieces and they were really interesting and inspiring, um, but the idea that we would sort of build on those, build on each workshop success it didn't really play out that way exactly. Um, so uh, what else can I tell you? I have so many things to tell you about this project. Uh, the last uh, step, sorry, I just skipped one. The last step of the process um, that we did for this project was that we put these um, maquettes and drawings and poems out into the architecture community. And we asked uh, young architects and students to do permit drawings of the pieces. Um, and those were also part of the exhibition. Um, and we didn't really realize the importance of that, I think, until later. Um, but uh, but it, was a, it was a way to um, lend credibility and translate these ideas into real projects. Um, and I think that that was important both for the exhibition but also for the artists that participated in creating the, the dream homes in the first place. Um, so we did a series of exhibitions. Eventually we started at the Y downtown here in Montreal, which was an amazing place to put anything out there into the public because everybody goes through there. It's, uh, you know, French students and uh, immigrants and all kinds of people. And I'm going to wrap this up really quickly. Uh, we did our last exhibition at the Musée de la Civilisation in Quebec together with another project that was um, young street photographers showing their work. Um, so it was a whole range of, of exhibition spaces, which was really rich for us. And I'm going to turn this over to William. My, my last little point was the lessons we learned. One is that us and them was really a, a, a non-existent category, we realized. Whatever big you know, openness we had going in, it was totally blown apart. There, there is no us and them, it's just all us. Um, and the second thing was that what we offered was as important as the listening as well. So I'm going to turn, turn the microphone over to William. Thank you so much, Colleen. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'll just share with you some notes uh, uh, with some distance with this project that was done a few years ago. Uh, first, as Olivier said, Execo is a nonprofit using art, social design, uh, philosophy, critical thinking as a tool to foster social inclusion uh, and social change. Our main goal is really to try to put forward transformative action aimed at challenging exclusive norms and to put forward a new, more inclusive ones. Uh, and to do so, we try uh, in every project to really work uh, directly with the people uh, facing the consequence of exclusion, uh, of the type of exclusion we're working on. And we recognize foremost the centrality of live experience as a form of knowledge. 
and the equal capacity of everyone to think about the world, about the, the, the way, the problem they're tackling, the solution to those problems. And this is really like the, the ground of our work. Um, this project was mainly realized uh, in the context of our uh, artistic residency program called Métissage Urbain. Uh, it's a program that supports participatory arts, uh, research creation project, uh, mostly in community settings, uh, such as uh, shelter, uh, community organization, or directly in the public space. Um, for instance, just to give you a quick example of other uh, similar projects, we had an artist called uh, Kenny Thomas, uh, aka Small16. He realized a, a, a project that was urban, uh, urban participatory musicals uh, sampling in the city to, re uh, to record the uh, sound and to try to mix them. With very an intercultural lens, we had another artist, uh, the Atikamek artist Miki Ottawa. Uh, she co-created a collective tribute uh, mural to indigenous women in the downtown Montreal. Uh, and this project is really part of this artistic residency project from our point of view. And um, after a few years, I think we, th this project, Chez Soi de Rêve, can also allow us to think critically about the way homelessness is changing and how the public response to it is still mostly inadequate. Uh, when this project was realized at first, um, hostile, hostile architecture, so the fact that there's uh, uh, urban, urban uh, uh, settings that are quite frankly hostile to being used by homeless people, it was very oddly uh, discussed topic uh, around homelessness. And so at the time it made a lot of sense to try to inverse the perspective, to ask how would homeless people design a space that truly is, that truly is theirs uh, to try to contrast it with the hostile architecture we were facing. And letting people think uh, about what's a home can be uh, through a series of very unique workshops, uh, allow for a rich brainstorming of new alternative ways to live in the world and to live in the city. Nowadays, with some distance though, uh, I think it's the last step that uh, Colin just talked about that appears the most, the most actual to me. Uh, that is the translation of those very extraordinary ideas into professional architectural plans. Uh, when we think about uh, uh, some, uh, some of the issues in the last uh, few years, for instance, the dismantling of encampment uh, by public authority, uh, I think this phase of this project can help to think about that and about the role of architecture uh, in this context. Uh, we realized that policymakers were already unable to uh, really try to build more social housing and to reduce poverty, should at least uh, try to support adaptive living solutions uh, such as the encampment made by and for homeless people instead of just destroying them in the name of public safety. And this is where I think architects and urban planners could play a very positive role uh, in, in supporting such improvised uh, solution. Uh, how? Like, like Colleen and Suzanne did by trying to provide technical expertise to promote uh, arm reduction and safety in those space. Architects know how to build a fire safe place. This is the kind of knowledge that could be mobilized uh, in the context of encampment and other uh, living uh, arrangement, emergency living arrangement. So here too, there are uh, ideas ground in live experience that need to be translated collaboratively uh, in safe and sound solution. I think there's the expertise right here. And uh, more broadly for UpEd, uh, there is really a need to try to foster uh, a top utopian vision of how we live together in space, just as this project did. Architects, designer, urban planner must play an essential role in, open, uh, in opening up alternative, more, more just future. In good, part, in good part by designing them and making them feasible and doable. And so by translating these ideas into real technical possibility, that's what uh, this project uh, uh, evoked to me uh, for the present. So uh, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Puis, euh, bon, euh, vous aurez la chance de poser des questions et de discuter un peu plus, euh, un peu plus avec le, toute l'ensemble de l'équipe plus tard. Uh, so the second team uh, that we'll present today is um, uh, Paul Dossett and Brandon Riddle. Uh, Paul Dossett is a leading thinker and advocate in the space of sustainability and architecture. For the past decade, Paul has been central to the introduction of sustainable architecture to the mainstream, while practicing deep community engagement with equity-seeking groups of all backgrounds and abilities. 
At the core of Paul's philosophy and practice is the belief that design and, and construction solutions should be simple, sensitive, and sustainable with a tri triple focus on people, planet, and prosperity. And Brandon uh, is a strategic designer and founding principal with the People Design Cooperative, a shared and democratic space for those who are working to make meaningful contributions to the design of our cities and, um, and homes. Brandon's cross-disciplinary career informs his work and leadership, spanning design and building, technology, research, and innovation. He balances his love for craft with a strategic approach to understanding and shifting power structures and building new, more sustainable models of working. For more than a decade, uh, Brendan has built interdisciplinary teams and creative spaces that work to change this, the way we approach the design and research of spaces, products, and programs. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je m'appelle Paul, and uh, now I have to turn and thank you for uh, indulging Brandon and I by accepting this presentation in English, so thank you so much for that. Um, I've been an architect for 30 years now, a little more than 30 years, um, and in that time I've learned a number of important things. But I just want to do a poll of the audience today. Put your hand up if you are an architect or on your way to becoming an architect. Wow, that's a, that's a good number. Uh, keep your hand up if you are a member of a cooperative. Okay, a much fewer number. We'll, we'll talk about that later. We're, we're going to get into that. Anyhow, um, in our education as architects, we are taught to make all of the decisions. That's basically what our education teaches us to do. Uh, it teaches us that we are God, essentially. Um, and we're not. Uh, um, we're expected to provide all of the answers. We're not really expected to ask questions. And what I've learned in my career is that we need to learn to ask a lot more questions. Questions are how we, are how we learn things. So over a decade ago, I began working on the community design initiative with the East Scarborough storefront and stumbled into what was probably the most important lesson of my career, that I cannot and I should not be making the decisions. That I should be facilitating the questions. That's really the most important thing that I learned. The Storefront is a community organization providing a diverse range of services to communities experiencing complex barriers. Over a period of seven years, the Community Design Initiative became one of the most groundbreaking participatory design projects in North America, engaging youth from one of the most marginalized communities in Canada to lead the redesign of their East Scarborough storefront. As a team at the storefront, we redeveloped a simple and essential principle that has shifted my understanding of the industry and my entire practice as a professional architect. We are to be experts on tap, not on top. As we kicked off the community design initiative, we asked one question. Can kids build buildings? The answer was yes. What we didn't expect to learn was that at the same time, buildings can build kids. In fact, amongst many other wonderful achievements, one of those kids is now the director of that same storefront. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, buildings can be built relatively quickly, uh, but it's not really until years later that we can see the most meaningful impacts uh, often. Uh, it's been, as Paul suggested, more than a decade since the Community Design Initiative at the East Scarborough Storefront launched. Um, and today, the People Design Cooperative is led by one of the youth that showed up initially for free pizza, then he turned into a co-lead of the initiative, uh, and now he is uh, the chair of our board of directors, again, more than a decade later. Um, uh, he happens to be one of the most dynamic and impressive young leaders I think that our country has met in a very long time. And at People, Paul, myself, uh, and the amazing team of founding members uh, set out to completely rethink our practice to be a shared and democratic space. Um, we want it to be a reflection, really, of our deepest values. 
we had this crazy idea that an organization with so much power around what our built environment looked like uh, should be shared by all. And today we work to design sustainable, low carbon, healthy buildings that truly meet the needs of the people who use and who steward them. Every project that we begin uh, starts with working with the individuals who are central to that work, putting the humans we are designing with and for at the center and actually placing power in their hands. In 2020, we worked with the Young Street Mission and a few other social service agencies uh, to create an education space with youth experiencing houselessness. We first invested in building capacity with one youth leader who was going to run the entire participatory design process um, with our steady support behind them. And through that and many other projects, we learned um, that the role of a designer and an architect is to be the invisible hand on the backs of those who are most capable of designing these new spaces, those with lived experience. Through this initiative, the youth taught us something that fundamentally shifted how our practice works. They taught us that the ideals that we strive for, the carefully curated architectural spaces that we always see in magazines, often a little absent of people or there's a blur blurry person dancing across them, um, can strip away our ability to actually learn about ourselves. They taught us not to design perfect spaces, but to design imperfect spaces that give them the ability to experiment and continue to learn about themselves as they exist in that space. And Jill gave me uh, technical language for this just now, uh, embodied cognition theory, uh, which I can't wait to read more about. Uh, regarding the project that brought us here today, in 2015, we began working with Egal Canada on a new transitional home for youth who identify as LGBTQ+. And at the end of 2020, it, opens, it opened its doors as the Friends of Ruby Home. Now, as, as we learned from Rebecca um, uh, earlier today from BC Housing, building new housing and shelters for underserved communities isn't always welcomed by neighborhoods. But because we invited community members in early, and because we also invited some of the youth that might be one day living in this house, uh, they had an opportunity to understand and invest in the project. What we got out of it was we got an opportunity to turn some of the neighborhood NIMBYs, the not in my backyard people, into YIMBYs, the yes in my backyard people. As, as Rebecca you know, uh, explained to us, um, while we often hear narratives about the risk to neighborhood character and safety, the Friends of Ruby Home has been embraced by the neighborhood from day one. The Garden District Residents Association has openly shared that this building has improved the security in their neighborhood. We also had a, an obligatory public consultation meeting, uh, the type that the city imposes on us uh, whenever there's new development in an area and the councillor of the, of the ward hosts it. And this, this particular uh, building was in, a, was in an area with a very progressive councillor and she had never seen a public consultation meeting where the public showed up in such rallying support of the project and to defend the safety and security of the youth who were going to be their new neighbors. It was, it was groundbreaking. Anyhow, um, when we kicked off the participatory, participatory design portion of the project, one of the partners, one of our partner team on the, on the design and construction team uh, told us, you can't do that. The kids will ask for pools and saunas and you can't deliver that. Well, the truth of the matter is that the kids didn't ask for pools and saunas. They asked for simple things that delivered comfort and dignity. They asked that the building be environmentally friendly and running a firm called Sustainable, that really wasn't difficult for me to imagine. Um, they asked for welcoming spaces, sp spaces that were not institutional. They asked for a balance of public and private spaces within that. Uh, for reasons that, uh, that Jill outlined to us. Um, they asked for the entire facility to be fully accessible. 
They asked for open spaces with lots of natural light, a color palette of neutral warm shades. They wanted to be, open, they wanted to be able to open their windows in their bedrooms and control the temperature in their rooms. Like, these are really basic things. This is what they asked for. They wanted private washrooms. Uh, they wanted hallways with no carpet because they recognized the problems than the challenges that carpet would have in a setting like this. They wanted a small fridge and a microwave uh, in, their, in their bedrooms, which one shelter manager at the Design Charette told us to avoid as the youth would start fires. Well, two years in, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Even very s small details, such as identifying the youth rooms as suites and not as rooms, because they felt that suites normalized their mailing addresses. They asked us for a doggy wash station for their pets so that, you know, so that they could take care of their pets in a dignified way. Um, the, and the, the added benefit is the cleaning staff just love this doggy wash station because it makes, you know, washing their mops and their pails so much easier. So everybody wins by the doggy wash stations. Um, the big ask, though, was for safe outdoor social space. And as the building doesn't have a lot of outdoor space around it, um, together with the youth, we designed a roof garden a roof garden with barbecues and gardening plots and gathering spaces. And it's one of the most used common spaces in the building today. We spoke a couple of days ago to the center's executive director, Carol Osler, and she told us some things that, uh, that, uh, they, that they're now experiencing, you know, uh, nearing year two. She told us that the youth are thriving. Since we opened, we have graduated 56 youth to affordable independent living. We have also shown the City of Toronto how to treat and support vulnerable homeless youth in a positive setting. There is also a youth committee at the house that participates in shaping how we operate the home and the programs we offer. And I can tell you that none of this would have happened if we had not suggested and then insisted upon participatory design against the strong opposition of one of our partners. Uh, we're just going to tease something, and I hope we can talk a lot more about this in the panel. Um, but some of you may be familiar with Sherry Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation. Um, this is a really wonderful model, and we kind of really simplified it on the bottom. Um, all too often today, consultation takes the form really of informing the public. A lot of the decisions have been made. The power is not actually being presented to those who it should be presented to. Um, and you're more being told what's about to happen, uh, not giving a, given an opportunity to help direct that. And from our perspective, and I think for everyone in the room here, we need to make a commitment to move as far up the ladder as we can to actually handing over power to allowing those with the lived experience to make the decisions and to being the, the invisible hand on the back. Um, from us at Sustainable, at People, um, I think in all of our amazing conversations with Pivot as well, and all of the partners that we've collaborated with over the last number of years, um, we truly believe deep down that our cities and spaces, our homes must, must be designed by community. Thanks everyone. Thank you for these very inspiring projects. I think they show great ideas about how to give voices to a lot of people. Um, and uh, I'm going to switch back to French. Donc, uh, on a encore une quarantaine de minutes. On n'ira pas tout de suite à la, à la nos participants ici, mais on voulait plutôt vous donner la parole. Euh, donc, pour les prochaines 30 minutes, je vous demande de, de rester à vos tables, de discuter au, autour de vos tables. Euh, autour de, de ces questions de qu'est-ce qui peut faire un bon processus participatif. On a eu des, des exemples ici de, 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 de projets, de façons de, de, de faire participer. Euh, on veut aussi profiter du fait qu'on a une, une, une audience variée aujourd'hui. Il y a des gens qui sont du domaine de l'aménagement, il y a des gens du travail social, il y a du, des gens de toutes sortes d'autres domaines. Donc, de voir aussi, faire partager, euh, partager entre vous qu'est-ce qui peuvent être certaines des limites qui viennent par exemple du fait qu'on est dans 
différentes disciplines ou qu'est-ce qui peut être certaines richesses qui viennent autour de, de, de ces échanges-là. Euh, on veut que, que vous pensiez, par exemple, à quel peut être, le, donc on a parlé beaucoup du, du rôle des architectes, du rôle des designers, donc quel peut être le, le rôle euh, des, des professionnels de l'aménagement dans des réflexions sur, euh, sur, sur des questions sociales plus, plus, plus larges. Euh, je regarde mes notes pour rien oublier. Euh, certaines des, certains des défis d'appliquer la, de, 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 de la théorie de la participation à euh, une pratique. Donc, euh, Brandon a fini à la fin avec une, une, une échelle. Pour montrer, okay, on a souvent cette vision théorique de comment on fait de la participation, mais comment ça se matérialise euh, dans, le, dans la pratique. Donc, c'est un peu le, le type de choses qu'on veut que vous regardiez. Euh, Ensuite, on va revenir après ce, ce 30 minutes-là pour discuter ensemble. Euh, donc, vous pouvez préparer des questions pour les panélistes, vous pouvez préparer des idées que vous voulez partager et avoir un peu le, le, leur retour. Donc, euh, on, on souhaitait avoir plus un, un, un dialogue autour de ces questions. Et puis, euh, on a on veut vous parler de, de ces thèmes-là, mais si vous avez des... des, euh, des euh, euh, voilà. Donc, pensez aux défis mais aussi aux opportunités qui viennent des, 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 des processus participatifs. En fait, ma question, c'est... Bon, je suis Robert Constantin, je suis architecte. Ma question, c'est... Avez-vous comme une espèce de méthode là, pour consulter là, puis les, les bons à la bonne place? Parce que souvent, on consulte, soit qu'il y en a que les décisionnels arrivent en dernier, soit qu'on on donne trop d'infos. Oui, on en reçoit, des fois on en déçoit, mais au bout fait, y a-tu quelqu'un qui a monté une espèce d'organigramme de, de tout ça? Là? Puis, pas les, parce que souvent, les projets, là, ça, des fois, c'est ça. Il y a des gens qui sont offusqués, ils n'ont pas ce qu'ils veulent. Qu'est-ce so, que vous en pensez? I can translate. Uh, so, is there any methods, any kind of organigram chart that helps us make sure that the right people are there at the right time, that there's just enough information, not too much? Not, so, is there, is there any, any recipe that, that works well? <laughs> C'est une super bonne question. Um, une des choses qu'on voulait adresser aujourd'hui, c'est justement les méthodes de faire la participation, uh, comment on le fait dans la vraie vie, et ça touche un peu à ça. Um, et je pense que ça dépend toujours du projet. Donc, c'est pour ça que les gens sont toujours très réticents à dire « voici la recette okay. ». Mais, okay. ceci étant dit, je pense qu'en début de projet, c'est possible d'identifier c'est quoi les questions qui sont importantes, qui sont les joueurs qui doivent être là, et de voir jusqu'à quel point ils peuvent être décisionnels. Je suis fermement de l'opinion qu'il faut poser la bonne question, parce que poser une question de « qu'est-ce que vous voulez dans un projet où on ne peut pas donner tout ce que les gens veulent », ça mène à beaucoup de frustration. Donc, il faut vraiment cibler aussi les questions qui sont posées pour qu'elles soient pertinentes au projet qui est là. Et je pense qu'il y a la question aussi de, des gens à l'interne, c'est-à-dire le design participatif avec les usagers, avec les, euh, les, les travailleurs et les, les processus qui sont plus larges, qui embarquent la communauté autour. Et quelques projets peuvent inclure un ou l'autre, parfois les deux. Bon, merci. Est-ce qu'on m'entend oui. J'ajouterais à ça qu'il faut voir le processus participatif comme étant quelque chose qui suit le projet tout au long. Donc, ce n'est pas un moment ou deux moments dans un projet, c'est vraiment un processus. Et euh, donc, dans cette optique-là, il y a différents, différents moments qui requièrent différents types de regroupements de personnes ou différentes questions euh, qui sont posées. Quelque chose que, que j'ai relevé, alors je discutais avec des tables aussi, ça a été sur la question de la transparence, sur les buts de la consultation, puis aussi sur on vous pose des questions pour avoir telle information, vous allez avoir de l'impact à tel niveau. Mais bon, ce qui est intéressant aussi dans le projet qu'on a fait avec Colin et Suzanne, c'est que nous, à Execo, on avait déjà un pied dans les organisations. On travaillait à la Maison du Père, à l'Accueil Bono, au Projet autochtone du Québec. Et donc, même si on voyait toutes sortes de personnes différentes, on était un peu connus. ex -aequo. on avait une relation de confiance. Et cette confiance-là aussi, peut-être, elle nous a permis de tisser une rencontre. 
et pas juste un rapport de « je prends, je donne » et juste d'un échange comme ça qu'on peut aller avoir dans la consultation, mais d'aller un petit peu plus loin dans la rencontre, ce qui a permis aux gens peut-être de se sentir euh, plus respectés, plus à part entière d'un processus, en fait. Now I have to try to not repeat. Uh, I don't speak French, I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to add two points, and hopefully I'm not repeating. Um, the first one is, in my opinion, I don't think you can ever have too much information. Um, Uh, but more importantly, I think one of the things that we've learned um, is you're not going to get it right. Uh, and so as much as we can design flexibility into these spaces, uh, like, you know, in my opinion, the most beautiful architecture is that which is adapted and broken and used and occupied um, because it means that it is working or it's been made to work for people. Um, and so if you can design that flexibility in or the opportunity for that flexibility in, then I think you can at least reduce some of the, the you know, worry of harm that, that could come from it. So that would be the big thing I would add. Thanks, Brandon. And of course, you know, invite all the people that you think should be at the table. And then when you first sit down, as a group, look around the table and figure out who's not there. And the second time you sit down, have all those people who were not there, there, and then do that exercise again. And do that exercise every time you sit down. Who's not here? And then invite those people next time. Peut-être ajouter juste un petit mot. Hein? Ben, premièrement, il y en a des, des, des méthodes un peu classiques de design social. Hein? On identifie le problème, on fait l'idéation. On expérimente en faisant des prototypes qu'on fait valider, qu'on revient, tout ça. Donc, il y a, il, ça existe. Souvent, l'élément qui va faire la différence entre un projet qui fonctionne et qui ne fonctionne pas, c'est l'exercice du jugement, du tact, euh, des personnes qui déploient un processus de design participatif, qui vont s'adapter, contourner parfois un peu les étapes classiques pour vraiment répondre à ce qui se passe euh, dans, la, dans, dans les ateliers. Puis il y a quelque chose que vous avez dit qui m'a accroché un peu. Peut-être que j'ai mal compris, mais vous avez dit les bottes à la bonne place. Well, les... et et ça, à mon avis, c'est la responsabilité, la responsabilité des architectes. C'est vous qui savez où ils vont les bolts. Consultez pas les... Tu sais, je sais que vous disiez ça un peu à la blague, mais il faut bien voir aussi c'est quoi l'expertise qui est amenée. Pas s'attendre à ce que les gens aient une expertise en architecture dans un processus consultatif. Et vous venir euh, peut-être remettre euh, dans la discussion les contraintes physiques, matérielles propres à l'architecture. Euh, pour que les gens aient aussi une conception réaliste. On fait juste prendre des idées euh, sans engager une discussion, un dialogue réel où on dit « Ah, ben ça, c'est pas faisable pour telle, telle, telle contrainte. » Peut-être que la discussion va amener puis on va voir « Ah, peut-être ce serait faisable sous quelles conditions. » Mais donc, cette nécessité d'avoir un dialogue où l'expertise des architectes, elle aussi est, est, est en jeu, pas seulement l'expertise vécue des personnes qui sont consultées. Mais euh, très, ouais, voilà. Bon, merci, thank you. I have a question for you. How, how long were you able to, to spend on the consultation and how, yeah, because like, but sometimes we talk about consultation, but people think it's just like a, a one evening in their project and uh, that's, yeah. That, yeah. Well, how was it for you? Okay, so of the, of the three projects we spoke about, um, the first one, the uh, community de design initiative with the East Scarborough storefront, we met with the youth every week, uh, every Thursday afternoon and evening for almost seven years. It was a long project. These, these kids got deep, deep into this project. The Friends of Ruby Home, um, for various reasons, we met with community members and the youth for one evening. So, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll take anything that we can get. Mm -hmm. Of course, like this process takes a long time. Building trust takes a really long time and it's so central to this work. Um, so a lot of it is like starting to train the market, having these conversations with people that you're working with to say, when we invest in this, the product turns out so much better. We, we de-risk it, whatever the, the fancy terms are that we need to use to sell it to, to their boards, to whoever's making the decision is really important. And I think it just takes practice to do that. Um, but when you start turning out projects like this and you start seeing the impact, not just the built form, but the, the wonderful youth and, and other participants that are emerging from this so many years later, um, I think the, the decision becomes much easier and then we get repeat customers. So. Bonjour. Uh, J'ai une question uh, pour vous tous. 
I will repeat it in English. Don't stare at me like that. <laughs> Um, so, ma question est comment est-ce que dans votre approche auprès des populations vulnérables que vous essayez d'inclure dans vos processus participatifs, comment vous trouvez l'équilibre entre euh, ne pas être paternaliste et ne pas avoir cette attitude de, de je veux vous protéger et une attitude inclusive et humble. Donc, comment trouver l'équilibre dans ça, je, je sais que c'est une question complexe, mais peut-être euh, peut qu'elle qu ne sera pas répondue aujourd'hui, mais je la pose quand même. So my question is, how do you find the balance between uh, in, in your approach to vulnerable people and into your inclusion to them into participative um, practices or, or methods? How do you find the balance between not being paternalistic and at the same time being humble and, and being respectful and being modest towards these people and uh, building this relationship of trust that you're talking about. Thank you. À ex aequo, en fait, ça va, être, ça va partir d'une posture euh, philosophique, en fait, aussi, où on approche, où on fait de la... On essaie d'être de, de, conscient qu'on arrive tous chargés de préjugés aussi, d'attitudes, de, de, des fois aussi de bonnes intentions, mais qui peuvent nuire, en fait, aussi à, à des relations. Et d'essayer un peu de suspendre nos préjugés, de rencontrer la personne dans son plein potentiel. Et donc, de ne pas dire euh, cette personne, parce qu'elle a tel vécu, elle, euh, donc de faire attention en même temps aux fragilités, mais de rentrer pleinement dans une re relation égalitaire avec l'autre personne. Et puis, je pense que c'est peut-être un moyen de, de, de contourner des fois des, 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 des tendances comme ça qui nous permettent d'être vraiment, et de se, se mettre en position d'apprenti aussi, d'être capable d'apprendre de l'autre, d'apprendre de son expérience, mais euh, le plus sincèrement et le plus authentiquement possible. Et, um, it was in your presentation, or maybe in the, uh, an article you share also, that you, you kind of, when you facilitate a, a consultation or a meeting with someone, you, you, when you do good work, you tend to, your role tends to, to be a, a disappearance. So you, you, a good facilitation is when the facilitation is disappearing and there's a truly a conversation like you just had on, at your table. En fait, je vais me rapprocher. Euh, en fait, je pense que Marie-Paul vient de mettre le doigt aussi sur quelque chose de clé. Euh, donc, on, on fait des processus de, 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 de design participatif dans plusieurs sphères. Quand Colleen et moi, par contre, quand, quand on a décidé ou on, on s'est mis dans la tête de cette idée de l'espace de rêve comme projet, on avait plein d'idées, mais on a assez vite réalisé que ça prenait absolument un, un ex écho dans notre projet pour que ça ait un certain succès. Et le succès n'est pas mesuré par... Euh, c'est pas pas facile à mesurer, mais je pense que dans l'idée qu'on a pu, pu, prendre, pu poser premièrement les bonnes questions de la bonne façon, euh, avec le soutien et, et le, le, la collaboration de tout le monde autour de la table, euh, je pense que est vraiment Execo est devenu essentiel pour nous dans ce projet-là. Les architectes n'ont pas toutes les réponses. Les architectes doivent poser des questions, doivent, doivent apprendre à écouter aussi, mais dans ce cas-ci, je pense que l'espace de rêve n'aurait pas existé sans l'apport d'Execo, de, qui, a, qui a permis d'ouvrir des portes, qui a permis d'avoir un lien de confiance beaucoup plus rapide que si on s'y était prise toute seule. Donc, euh, voilà, ça complète peut-être un peu ce que tu, euh, ce que tu mentionnais. And uh, uh, th thank you. As, as Marie-Paul said, our, our job is really a disappearing act. And In my observation, there are a few key elements to this, to this recipe. One, as you mentioned, is to establish trust. Um, we've been very lucky. There have been other organizations on the ground working with the people that we're ultimately working with. There's been organizations on the ground before us, and they've established the trust. They've brought us in. We ride on some of the trust they've already established, but we can't destroy that. We have to be very careful to keep that trust going. Um, it's also very important that we show up with open minds and open hearts, uh, that our ears are open and our mouths are closed, usually, which is kind of ironic that I'm sitting up here talking in a microphone. <laughs> and um, 
It's also, it's also really important we found that we share food uh, almost every time in the interaction. And share food is not bring in pizza. Share food is usually each of us brings food from our own culture and we talk about it and we share it that way. We share our food, we don't share general food. Um, and it's also really important that we have fun. Uh, generally, I find that if I'm not having fun, I got to think of another way to do it. There's, there is another way and make it fun for everybody. Thanks. Bonjour à tous, Monique Moussa, Ville de Montréal. Je suis chargée de projet, euh, donc je travaille avec des équipes multidisciplinaires. Euh, vous avez répondu à une partie de mes questions en attendant mon tour. Donc, euh, j'aimerais savoir, je comprends que dans un projet, le processus participatif, le plus tôt il est en amont dans le projet, ça aide dans la prise de décision et ça diminue le risque. Mais d'un côté, euh, on connaît que si on est en amont, on n'a pas toutes les réponses, mais si on est en, euh, en aval, on a toutes les réponses et la prise de décision est difficile. Donc, euh, comment vous mettez vos limites et c'est quoi l'impact que vous palliez le plus qui est le temps qu'on est alloué à le, au projet et dans tout ça, comment vous palliez avec le cadre de gouvernance dans les différents projets existants Donc, uh, while I was waiting my, my turn, a part of you de, uh, responded to my question, but I was asking about the process and how do you cope with the time of the project given and uh, the governance put on the project Uh, in, in, the, in the project, so that's it. Thank you. Uh, again, um, these projects, I mean, every project is different. Uh, there's constraints that you're going to encounter, of course, and sometimes uh, as much as we dream for like blank sheets, a lot of decisions may have been made for you. Um, And, you know, so of course we have to exist within those constraints. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of how to best answer this. Um, I think, <clears throat> I, I think it, you know, it, it takes a lot of time, I think, um, to, um, there's cases where it depends who's in the room. There's, there's an, like examples where Um, you know, uh, you'll get into one session and a lot will be produced and, and where, um, where you'll show up and, you know, one person will be there or no one will be attending and you have to continue to show up uh, and do that. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to partners as well too. Like, uh, you know, I think again to, to some of the conversation we've had, don't do this alone. Don't try to go it alone. Um, it's not going to go well. I don't know if that fully answered your question. But. Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit to add to that, um, really, as Brandon said, in response to another question, um, you're not going to get it right, um, certainly not every time, but you're going to get something of it right. And hold on to those pieces and learn from them and refine as you go. Even with the group you're working with, refine as you go. Keep changing strategy. The, the number of times, especially in that seven-year period with the youth at uh, the East Scarborough storefront, um, You know, we walked in, we had, you know, whole weeks planned of what we were going to do. And then we had a session and all of our plans for the next six weeks, we just threw them out because the session took us in a whole different direction. So you just have to, you have to remain flexible all the time. I think, I think there are a couple of things. I think in projects, sometimes we have to fight for the space to do participatory design, so to push Um, funders or clients to leave a window for that. Sometimes we have to push clients to include more people uh, than they might be comfortable including. Um, and then sometimes we just have to squish it in and be strategic about which workshops we're going to do too and they're going to be with these people and we're going to do them when we can. So it's a little bit of push and pull, I think. Yeah, and one, one thing we do sometimes is say, like, when we're just building trust with one of the, the funders or the clients, We'll say, let, let us just try a little piece and come, because you have to be part of this too. You're, you're bored, mm -hmm. everyone has to come. And just, if they show up for one night and it, it doesn't, it can be absolute chaos, 
uh, and there's like pizza flying and you know, hopefully <laughs> better stuff than pizza um, and ideas and all of that, but they'll fall in love with the process and it's not hard to start to see how that transforms. So you know, some of it is storytelling, some of them is showing them excellent examples, taking them on tours of places um, and talking about and getting them to fall in love with that story. And some of it is just like sampling a little bit, saying, look, if we can earn your trust, give us like two weeks and two sessions and then if you like it, you have to promise to do this bigger piece with us. Um, but, but always what we're selling to them is, or convincing them of really is like, let's go slow to go fast. Let's make sure that we get it right up front because it's gonna go a whole lot quicker and smoother down the road. Well, I think this idea of falling in love with the process is a great way to end the session. But um, if, I don't know if any of you has any final words Seems like you, you might. <laughs> I do. Uh, I, I, I got elected. I, I drew the short straw here. <laughs> so uh, we have a takeaway question for you because we had a starting question and I could see a whole bunch of stickers up on the, up on the board at the back. So if you still have your stickers with your uh, responses to the earlier one, make sure your stickers go on the board at the back. But uh, we have a takeaway question. Um, First of all, I want to thank you for your participation in this discussion. Uh, it's, been, it's been really great. And as a parting thought, we would like for each of you to consider what can we do, each of us individually and collectively, to ensure that participatory designers speak to and hear people who are experiencing homelessness. Little heavy thought for the afternoon. <laughs> so thank you for this great discussion and